it's at the yeah okay we got it okay um this network is coordinated at the dutch embassy by gilly gurel who could not could not be present this evening to my regret for now i will have to do all the talking uh between the events Never, nevertheless her influence will be felt since she found the lecturer of this evening we thank her for her efforts to our regret as a result of the war we had to cancel an already well organized live clavering lezing lecture with reception in tel aviv's faculty of engineering it was mainly organized by assistant associate professor offer sheer of the tel Chai college and we postponed it till the next year which is of course now this year 24 so on the 26th of november we hope to meet you all with the reception and the lecture at which we can talk uh, from person to person the lecture of this evening is the Kleveringa lecture of 2023 and it is by zoom because of the war now i have a practical remark uh, we are recording this zoom as you might have noticed noticed if an alarm is sounded in your area please take care of yourselves go to your safe place and come back to your computer later on you need not leave the zoom you can simply come back and continue to see and hear and what you missed you will be able to follow later after we publish the recording on the website of the Ergunole Holland and you will get a link for that. Questions and answers will only be after the Kleveringa lezing itself and I request not to interrupt. Uh, we will keep you unmute. Uh, we will keep you muted, but sometimes it goes wrong and then uh, so I, I I will be very thankful if you do not interrupt speakers or uh, what comes after it. We thank the Leiden University Fund and the Embassy of the Netherlands in Ramadgan for their assistance in all our trouble organizing this lecture. Now I go to my um, first, uh, our first guest, uh, who is the she is the ambassador of the Netherlands in Israel, a new ambassador, Mariette Schuurman. And because you are new, Mariette, I would like to tell something to um, the people who are watching and listening. Um, you are not new at um, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You are there for a long time already. And previously, the Dutch, uh, you were the Dutch ambassador to North Macedonia. If I make a mistake, you can tell me. Uh, longer ago, uh, you held various positions at the Dutch embassies in Zambia, the Russian Federation, and you were head of a mission in Sudan. This is, of course, not complete, but we have no more time. Uh, you have been a human rights ambassador, and you led the task force for Dutch membership of the UN Security Council in 2018. And you worked for NATO as special represent representative for women, peace and security. Just the right person for our region, I thought. Only weeks after you landed in Israel, the war broke out. Um, it, I, I can only add that is, it is very reassuring to have someone at the Dutch embassy with both work experience and great empathy. I leave it to you now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kaya, for your kind words and your kind introductions. Um, indeed, it's good to see um, people online who I already met in person uh, and those uh, that I hadn't had the opportunity to meet in person hope to meet you soon yeah, in person and as Gaia said at least you know for next year uh, uh, the li live uh, Kleveringa lezing. Um, I'm very happy that we can have this, 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 this lecture um, online 
uh, in these circumstances. And let me start by saying that obviously also when I arrived in, as ambassador and when we were organizing this, this lecture, we didn't see coming what happened to us. And I would like to start with presenting really my heartfelt condolences to all of you who are affected personally in your families, in your communities, in your country uh, by the war, um, the loss of life, and also all those who are deeply concerned about the safety of their children and grandchildren who are serving um, at our borders. Um, I would also like to thank IOHA for their, um, IOHA for their very proactive support in reaching out to the community, using their networks, establishing an emergency fund uh, in a very timely fashion, which is critical in these difficult times. I also think that the Kleveringer lazing, although we have to, so the lecture, although we have to do it online, unfortunately, it's maybe never been as important and as relevant as it is now. Um, I think uh, Miri will talk more about Kleveringer, but it's important to keep remembering his courage and his action in speaking up um, for his Jewish teacher and friend, without mentioning that he is Jewish, um, and um, in, in times of obligation and prepare, being prepared to, to pay the price. Um, so we are no longer occupied. We live in a free country and yet um, anti-Semitism and all other kind of forms of racism, bigotry, dehumanization, are still in our societies, even in comfortable and well-to-do societies like the Netherlands. And I think it's important to remember our obligation to keep standing around also our Jewish community in the Netherlands um, that is ours um, and to speak up for them. I think also the, the, the topic for today um, um, is very topical as well in these circumstances. Um, uh, as the introduction said, I think it's not only that we no longer know what the truth is, we don't, we no longer agree how to arrive um, at the truth. And that is very detrimental, devastating um, for the fabric of our free society. So I think to learn more today, and I'm really looking forward, I hope we'll also get us better informed in how we protect ourselves against it and how we can better resist um, manipulation of the truth um, and and divisions in our societies, um, um, let's say by information warfare. Um, but we will hear from Alex um, much more uh, detail on how it works and how to be resilient. Um, finally, I would also like to echo thanks. So first of all, thanks to uh, Ioha and particularly to you, Chaya, for organizing it this for the alumni work, uh, network and particularly the small group of um, students from the Leiden University who indeed already had this lecture, the speaker and the venue Tel Aviv University organized um, uh, before, you know, things took another turn. Um, and finally to Dr. Um, Alex Gekker, um, not an alumni as I understand from the Leiden University, but a resident living in Leiden as well as a guest researcher at Leiden. Um, and you stepped up to the challenge um, and was willing to share your very valuable time with us to share your, your knowledge and the latest knowledge. So um, I hope really, I'm really looking forward to the lecture and I really hope that, um, that this year, by the end of the year, we have finally our Klevering Falaising live and in person um, uh, with all of you. Back to you, Haya. Thank you very much. Um, we go we go on with our um, our plan, and I invite uh, Miri Sharon to speak. Um, my, our questions are: What is the meaning of the Cleveringa lazing uh, lecture? So why why do we hold it every year? And I myself am not a Leiden. Alumna, alumna. So I invited a more qualified person from the Dutch alumni network. It's fantastic that it exists. And uh, 
uh, I asked her to dedicate some words to the memory of Professor Rudolf Kleveringa. Uh, Marion, have you unmuted uh, Miri? Yes, I just don't know what her name is and I can't find her to unmute her. Miri so please. Huh? Miri Sharon. Yes, but I can't find her on the. I don't think she is here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, yes, wonderful. She's here. here she is. Okay. okay. Uh, so I, I go on I with my me, introduction. Uh, you are unmuted. Okay. Okay. I, sorry. Mary, Mary Sharon, I have to introduce her to you. It's a very spe special ter uh, person. Uh, because she is an Israeli and is still a Dutch alumni, I was so surprised to to see that um, many Dutch alumni actually are not Dutch at all. But that had to do with um, with the policy of uh, universities in the Netherlands to have uh, lots of uh, students from abroad. So Miri Sharon is now a PhD student at Tel Aviv University, writing her doctorate on international law. And in the past, she studied in the law faculty of Leiden University, where Professor Kleveringa long ago had his chair. She graduated there, cum laude, and became an international law and criminal justice expert, working for the United Nations for 18 years, first 10 years in Vienna, and later on from her home in Tel Aviv. It is an honor that she will introduce us now to the background of the Kleveringa lectures. Miri. Thank you, Chaya, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm very honored uh, to present a little bit about the Kleveringa lecture as a Leiden student in, in my past. So this lecture was given in November 1940, uh, only six months after the beginning of the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands in May of that year. You should know that at the time there were about 140,000 Jews living in the country and 102,000 of them would eventually be murdered, mainly in Auschwitz and Sobibor during the five years of brutal occupation. All this was happening during this systemic, systematic and deliberate destruction of European Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators in the Holocaust. But in May 1940, and during the first months after the German invasion, the population of the Netherlands was not yet aware of what would happen. Uh, but Jews soon started to feel the anti-Semitic measures taken against them. One of these measures was the removal of Jews from public office those employed by the national or local governments from the lowest clerks up to the president of the Supreme Court and university professors among them. This has led to the very first and also very few public protests against the exclusion of Jews from Dutch society by Professor Kleveringa. Professor Edward Myers was one of the Jewish professors at the Leiden Law Faculty. On the morning of the 26th of November, 1940, he received a letter informing him in the following words, as directed by the State Commissioner for the Occupied Territory of the Netherlands pertaining to non-Aryan government staff and those of equal status, I inform you that with effect from today, you are discharged from your position as professor at the State University of Leiden. Rudolf Kleveringa, Leiden Professor of Civil Law, and the dean of the law faculty at the time, took over Meyer's class for that day. He spoke to the students in the academy building and told them exactly what had happened. After mentioning the letter, he chose to speak about his mentor and colleague's tremendous scientific contribution to the development of just civil law, without referring at all to Meyer's Jewish background or making any political arguments. He listed Meyer's publications and awards and highlighted his achievements. He concluded by explaining that the just Dutch constitution allowed any Dutch citizen to fill public position and that according to the laws of the war, the occupying forces should respect the laws of the land occupied. The hall was packed. Outside the building, people could follow his plea through loudspeakers. 
The following day, Professor Kleverinha was arrested by the German security forces, and until the summer of 1941, he was detained in the prison in Stavingen, where many other uh, from the resistance movement would be detained during the occupation. The students at the Leiden University responded by distributing copies of the speech to other universities. These students also went on strike and eventually the university was closed during the entire period of the occupation. Later on, Klaverin Ha was also imprisoned in one of the Dutch camps in Hooft for his role in the resistance, but he survived the war. So did Professor Myers, who was one of the survivors of Theresienstadt concentration camp liberated in 1945. Leiden University finally reopened its doors after the liberation in 1945, and both professors returned to their positions. The courageous attitude of Professor Kleverinha, which as Ambassador Sherman mentioned, is as relevant today as it was then. He spoke up against injustice and for academic freedom in spite of the personal risk to him he was later honored by the establishment of a Clairvoyant Chair at the Leiden University and by holding the annual lectures. With this lecture we are about to hear, we all actively participate in remembering and acknowledging Professor Clairvoyant's attitude and the memory of the Holocaust. Thank you. Unmute. Thank you very much. I um I'm very happy that you uh, were willing to do this and um people who are not from the Netherlands have to learn a, a lot about uh, it before they can speak uh, uh so beautifully about Professor Kleveringa. Um now I'm going to introduce to you uh, the main topic of this evening. Uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Alex Gecker. Alex Gecker was born in Kharkov, nowadays Kharkiv, in the Ukraine. He came to Israel as a small, small child. And when he grew up, he went to study at Tel Aviv University, where he became a senior lecturer in the communications department. However, being not a man of long of one location, he completed his PhD, surprisingly, at Utrecht Universiteit in the Netherlands, where he participated in a research project of the European Research Council on Digital Mapping Practices. The title of his doctorate relates to this, Uniquitous Cartography, Causal Power in Digital Maps. Today, he is Assistant Professor of Digital Research Methods at Media Studies, University of Amsterdam. His relation to Leiden University comes to us through his participation in a research project at the Lucas Center, the Leiden University Center for the Arts in Society. This project is the reason why he qualified in the eyes of, in, of the Leiden University Fund to hold the Klevering lecture, Kleveringa lecture for us today. Alex, this is your topic. Thank you very much, Chaya. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Sperman. Uh, thank you, Miri. You have a warm regards from my wife, Netta, who you happen to know. Uh, and uh, um, thank you all for uh, giving me the time of the day. I am indeed uh, a professor and assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam, but I do have a very strong connection to Leiden, including the fact that I have lived in Leiden for more than a decade. And I am talking to you now from Leiden, from the Professor Weich, uh, famously built to accommodate university professors for Leiden universities in the 30s. So that seems fitting. Um, I will be talking for hopefully slightly less than half an hour. Um, I want to keep the conversation going, and I know that not everybody have the, like the, the Zoom is not the best way to, to conduct very long and, and detailed lectures. So, so I'll, I will do it rel hopefully relatively briefly, 
going over some points and then in the time that we have we can um have maybe more of a kind of a salon discussion of the stuff that i've been talking about um i will now attempt to do this thing where i show you only the presentation and not everything else how does that look yeah all right so um and now there's this change do you see me do you see the name okay yes all right okay so but this is always the embarrassing part because uh, uh as somebody who's uh, officially in digital research it's much more embarrassing when the digital tools that you use uh for presentation are not listening to you okay so um what I will be talking about is the um indeed the idea of truth and truth in the age of social media and particularly recently more and more in the age of generative AI, which I will explain when we get to it what and how we understand generative AI. But I I want to start with in the end. I will give you the main point, the main takeaway that I want you to take away from this evening, and then you can log out from my perspective because I have given you the uh, main thing. But through this, I will unpack what I want to say. So many of the conversations of the conversations happening today on social media are truth agnostic. They do not, not that they are anti-truth, but they in many ways don't care for truth. People want to belong and engage. And more importantly, this fits platforms like Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, broader aims. Truth, in this sense, is becoming much more partisan. It depends on who you are and which other people you associate with and how you see yourself, rather than uh, as an objective reality. And, and in the end, generative AI, in this sense, creates both challenges and opportunities for intervening in this uh, truth agnostic landscape. Okay, so this is the this is the uh, the proposition. This is the claim that I will be making this evening, and to do, make this claim, I will go through three separate uh, subsections. Let's call it like that: play, conversation, and endlessly arriving. Uh, not endlessly, and in the end, arriving at truth, or we we do endlessly arrive at truth, but that's a different story. Let's start with play. And I titled this section Engagement in, and its Discontents because engagement is a very interesting prism through which we understand play and how play is being, um, I don't want to say weaponized, but, but maybe appropriated or used as a tool in online discussion. And I feel like this is also quite appropriate because one of the founding fathers of uh, play research is uh, Johan Hausinger, also from uh, Leiden University, um, and even has a building on his name, which we often meet, where we often meet as a team. Um, and to start this uh, discussion of play, and particularly play in online discussion and in contemporary digital politics, I want to go to QAnon. Uh, now, many of you probably have heard of this, or at least encountered this in the news, um, it is a phenomenon that a bit difficult to define. Um, it's not so much as organization because it doesn't really have a leadership, but more perhaps a movement in the sense that it has followers and, and some broad tenets or goals that people subscribe to. Uh, you probably encountered it in the context of American politics, perhaps uh, in the context of the um, uh, armed or, or at least violent uh, protest and, and, and specifically the insurrection uh, that happened on uh, January 6, 2021. But uh, when we look at the start of this uh, movement, it's much more innocuous. So this is uh, the original drop, so-called Q drop, on the image board 4chan, which is a online forum, for lack of a better word, which is very deeply embedded in, in internet subculture and, and often like quite extreme, extremist 
political views, but it is also very much tongue in cheek. It's also kind of playful and it plays with language and it plays in meaning. And one of the aspects that it does so that is that most people who post on this forum are anonymous by design. And the original narrative of Q is quite straightforward, right? Uh, it draws from very, a variety of conventional and almost cliche conspiracy theories and conspiracy tropes. Um, in an initial stage, it like let's say 2017 until 21, it revolves around this type of, you see look, those type of messages posted on the 4chan politically incorrect board by uh, this guy, this elusive person, personality named Q, uh, who claimed to be a high security clearance government insider with Q clearance, which is a designation in American intelligence services uh, that, that has to do with nuclear weapons, but uh, this guy used it as uh, like high level security clearance um, stand in. And he claimed to be, um, to have insider knowledge about secret war between um, then new President Trump and his allies against the so-called deep state that is actually controlling Washington and the American government. So in such a drop, Q announces Hillary Clinton and other high-ranking members of the Democratic Party will soon be arrested in the role of in a satanic pedophilic ring catering to the world elites. Um, a lot of it also like has to do with if you dig deep enough or, or not, not even necessarily dig deep enough, but if you dig a bit, you find connections to classic anti-Semitic trop tropes of blood libel and kidnapping of children. So there's quite a lot of that there. So he talks about this. He links it to cryptic illusion by then President Trump at press conference a few months prior to that, uh, where he talks about the calm before the storm. So something that's about to happen and um, and other predictions follow. A lot of other predictions follow. And of course, while none of these predictions came true, uh, this didn't halt Q's rise. Whereas in October and November 2017, Anon, QAnon lived mainly an obscure life on 4chan and A-chan, another forum, similar forum. It later spread to Reddit and alternative news sites before jumping to social media platforms and the mainstream news somewhere in around July 2018 and becoming more and more widespread phenomena. Now, in the second stage, where the, as it became more and more mainstream, um, yes. Um, my slide. Yeah, great. Uh, the second phase, QAnon became full-blown conspiracy movement with growing ties to U the U.S. political system and even receiving some support, often like not direct, but hinted support from elected Trump-associated uh, so-called MAGA Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and some others. It also uh, really fueled the flames of the events leading up and the and uh, leading up and, and the actual event of storming the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, in during which many protesters were carrying QAnon flags and protest signs with phrases like "Where we go, one we go all," um, etc. And during this later phase, the newly engaged publics drawn into QAnon, which were typically Trump voters on the already conspiratorial edges of the Republican Party, were probably unfamiliar with the self-referential and playful media practices characteristic of image boards like 4chan. And as it made its way across platforms, QAnon came to mean many different things to many different people. And for this reason, um, we, I want to reflect on QAnon's origins in what uh, researchers Phillips and Miltner in 2017 call the ambivalent internet and what happens when something like QAnon escapes the boards and leaks into the non-ambivalent internet. So by that, I'm trying to say that originally you could take QAnon as a joke, as an in-joke perhaps. It didn't really matter if you believed in the QAnon conspiracy or not. You posted it because it was a good joke. And in the confines of 4chan, you couldn't even really say 
who was joking and who was not, who was a true believer and who was not. And it didn't particularly matter because the point was not the belief. The point was not the truth. The point was the game, playing and posting and deciphering those messages, uh, which I'll show you in a bit. And slowly but surely, as described by the video essays, Dan Olson in um, his excellent online um, documentary, In Search of Flat Earth, which I highly recommend, despite it being uh, more than an hour long. Um, so a lot of the kind of fringe, uh, dissatisfied people, in this case, uh, flat earthers, people who believe that actually the earth and flat is flat and try to prove it to themselves and each other, became more and more drawn to QAnon and missing the original ambivalence, the original um, attempt of, or, or not attempt, the, 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 the presence of the original um, ambivalence of whether it's true or not, whether I believe it or not, whether I play in it or not, and, and just took it as is. And one big part of what you, as an external observer, don't necessarily see in when you look at the movement like QAnon is the playful and fun aspect of being a QAnon adherent. Because it also has all those um, pu like puzzles and, and secret messages and, and uh, you develop an internal language that, that you learn to recognize. Uh, this is very much a playful activity, particularly again in the early stages, maybe less so as, a, uh, as it went later and later. People were having a lot of fun with QAnon. And when you hear the word play and QAnon side by side, you might experience an understandable reluctance, right? After all, since when are far, you know, right-wing conspiracy narratives uh, linked to the capital storming playful? And indeed, as noted by uh, Finnish researcher Jakob Stenros in 2019, play tends to be idealized and homogenized, both by scholars and everyday accounts like how we talk now, uh, when we tend to emphasize positive aspects of play, such as enjoyment or personal growth, while ignoring or sidelining the negative aspects of play, such as the, the rise of frustration of play or bullying that can happen through with children through playful activities. Nonetheless, when we think of play, when we think of what it means to play, we can Imagine a plethora of human activities. You can think of children playing and learning through playing. You can think about sports. You can think about music. But you can also think about, again, uh, bullying, what, what's called dark play. People enjoying um, trolling and, and harming and griefing others through uh, mean play. But you can also think about play as wasteful, play as being a, you know, a waste of time. You, like, you're not working, you're playing. Right, so play is this is is this type of really interesting human activity that seems very simple but defies straight um, understanding. And in fact, building on a, a, a relative recent paper by um, researchers Masek and Stanros from 2021, uh, where they looked at the large scale review, a meta review, as we say in in research of various definitions of play and playfulness across uh, different disciplines, right? So they, they looked at a total of 429 journal articles and book chapters from psychology and education to, to game design and computer science. And where they couldn't find one agreed definition, they found a central principle that nonetheless does unify the different way that we think about play. And this principle is the idea of engagement. And here I quote them, playfulness was widely characterized as a unique method of becoming involved as opposed to creating distance. So when we think about play as primarily engagement, as being very engaged in something, it presents a relatively neutral criterion for assessing play the play success. And it's irrelevant to otherwise different domains uh, ranging again from video games to marketing to politics. And then we can also think about play as um, engagement in relation to uh, something that 
will come up in the next part of our uh, of our discussion, which is engagement metrics on social media. But in order to talk about engagement metrics on social media, we need to talk about social media in general. And for that, we need to talk about the way that we are having conversations today. Or who are we talking to? And how we, are we talking to those people? This is Jackson Hinkle, the infamous, I should say, Jackson Hinkle. If you've spent some time um, looking into disinformation, misinformation, or reading about uh, the key figures in, for example, uh, the online covering of um, the recent war, you will come across this guy. So once involved in local politics, he's American, once involved in local politics from a rather leftist perspective, today he's kind of a, a poster boy for the conspiratorial right. Um, you can see his, uh, this is a tweet or, a, an, or an X post, I guess. This is what we're calling them now on the right, where he says Israel commits huge terror attack in Iran, which is linked to an hour and a half video of him. Uh, covering the news, but also covering himself and also like discussing it in parallel with people on his Telegram channel. Um, and here you can see his description of the profile. Help me expose the propagandist by subscribing to my X premium for $3 and then an email address. And I think like this is a, this is a pretty good, this gives you a pretty good idea of what a conversation online looks like. He's a very popular um presence on uh, X, previously Twitter, you can see that uh, this tweet where he, uh, this like recent tweet from him accusing Israel of uh, the major um, bombings in Iran yesterday, uh, two days ago, sorry, I kind of lost track of time, um, has gained 2.3 2, 2 thousand likes and seven, almost 700 reshares. So people are listening to him and he talks, he communicates, he's kind of a charismatic guy, he's a great communicator, but also he very, very much lies. And it has been, it's not my personal opinion, I mean, it is also my personal opinion, but it has been proven time and time again by independent, um, um, you know, verifications accounts and, and fact checkers. And, and this leads us into this really uncomfortable territory of asking, how does conversation and those type those type of conversations that, that, that this guy is having about, in this case, uh, our, the current Israel-Gaza war, um, are helpful or detrimental to democracy? And the problem that we that this is a thorny question and that we, it's, it's difficult to raise this question is that it automatically enters this this uncomfortable area of saying who is allowed to say what and who is responsible for moderating speech, which is something that the major platforms do not want to do. They do not want to be seen as biased in to any side of any conversation. So if you ask big platforms like Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter X or YouTube, they are not responsible or mostly not responsible for determining um, who can say what, unless it's very extreme on their platform. So, but let's do try to, to talk about, to converse about conversation. And to do that, I want to um, rely on a classic paper by a communication theorist and scholar by the name of Michael Scusson, um, from 1997 called Why Conversation is Not the Soul of Democracy. And in this paper, he distinguishes between two types or two models of conversations. First is the sociable model of conversation. Um, the other is the problem-solving model of conversation. And I'll briefly introduce them and explain why when we think about conversations and when we think about talking to people and particularly talking to people online, um, we might be confusing between the two. So for Spatson, the sociable understanding, and I will I will just read his definition because I find it quite concise and well, uh, the distinguishing feature of the sociable ideal is its insistence that conversation be non-utilitarian. In conversation, as political philosopher Michael Oakeshott wrote, the aim is not inquiry, 
there is no hankering after a conclusion. Neither informing nor persuading are crucial. Reasoning is not sovereign, and conversation does not compose an argument. Conversation has no end outside itself. It is unrehearsed intellectual adventure, and, as with gambling, its significance lies neither in winning nor in losing, but in wagering. Right? So this is, think about like the uh, talking to a friend. This is the sociable understanding of conversation. You don't have necessarily a goal when you talk to a friend. I mean, you might have, you know, a goal like catching up or or, or convincing them that, you know, to go out for, for coffee or something like that. But conversation is has no end outside itself. Conversation is the point. And this is one understanding of conversation. But when we talk about politics and when we talk about online discussion and when we talk about democracy, there's also a different type of understanding of conversation. And this is the problem-solving understanding. And Schwarzen continues, in contrast, the problem-solving understanding of conversation finds the justification of talk in its practical relationship to the articulation of common ends. Popular voting, majority rule, and other indices of democracy are vouched for, John Dewey wrote, by the fact that they involve a consultation and discussion which uncover social needs and troubles. This is the type of conversation when we talk about that we talk about when we talk about like the the health of the public sphere or the toxicity of online conversations, where conversation is not necessarily defined, and this is what of course Hudson is quite important, not necessarily defined by um, nicety. Um, but in fact, the need to uncover social needs and troubles. This conversation is not particularly nice. So you could say, well, look at Hinko. He is engaged in not so nice conversation. He says things that we do not perhaps do not want to hear. But is it a useful conversation? Is it a conversation that nonetheless allows us for uh, this type of democratic proceedings that that's Hudson emphasized? Well, not exactly, because one part of the problem with those type of conversation, particularly on a platform like Twitter X, is that it is not guarded by uh, rules that allow for those type of antagonistic conversation to develop, partially because of its engagement metrics, partially because people can gain uh, a lot of success on this platform, not necessarily by adhering to rules of polite or of, of polite, but rules of such antagonistic discussion aimed at uncovering some truth, but by ignoring them completely, as was shown for Hinkel when he lies and nonetheless gains a lot of following. Um, I think for Israelis, it's maybe more clear when you think about the large wave of protests that engulfed the country for months upon end uh, after the attempted judicial coup and the kind of the unprecedented protest that, that arose um, after it. And a lot of what you heard from the protesters is breaking the norms of conversation, is changing the rules of the game inside the country of who can say what and who can determine in the end which sides will be heard and which sides will not be heard. And the idea that changing the rules by one side specifically was completely not okay for many people because it also indicated the shifting of from the public to the sectoral and the creation of rules of conversation and through them rules of governance or governing that specifically benefit those who are currently in power, whereas this idea of conversation as, um, again, problem solving, makes us think of having conversations, having difficult and ongoing conversations, but in a way that would allow those who are currently not in power potentially to convince um, the, the public opinion, for example, and thus gain power. But we can also not ignore the uncomfortable truth that part of um, perhaps 
the reason for participating in the movement and in the discussions um, surrounding the, the, the coup, the reforms, uh, depending, you know, if you're coming from the, the, the pro, uh, pro government side that you call it one way or, or the other. So all this has to do also with this warm, fuzzy feeling of being in group. Uh, resisting the coup or supporting the reform brings tangible benefits. It becomes part of your you know, identity. You develop a, a language, a shared language with the people. You uh, gain followers, perhaps, just like Henkel, as I showed before, gained a lot of followers based on his line uh, regarding, the, re regarding first Russia, Ukraine, and now Israel, Gaza, right? Uh, and you also, and, and this, this kind of in-group belonging, this binary thinking of us and them is also very much reflected in the online platforms that we inhabit and that this conversation takes place. You can see this here, for example, quite easily in the, um, uh, in the engagement metrics of a tweet by the uh, finance minister of Salas Mortridge. A um, couple of from, from his visit into uh, in the United States, uh, where people pro him and anti him, pro government, anti government, essentially try to gain literally score points and to become visible on the platform because visible because the the amount of likes, the amount of impressions, views that a response gets has direct ramifications for how visible it is and so how much. Um, cloud, how much power or perceived power you gain in the eyes of the people that you are becoming, um, that you are you want to become part of, right? And this is the engagement aspect we spoke of in, in QAnon as well. The pleasure of belonging, the joy of being understood, alongside potential material conditions, right? Because one thing that happened with uh, X in the last couple of months and that some of the other platforms have as well, is the focus on monetization. Um, creating content, whether this content is ethical or not, whether your facts are correct or not, can be lucrative business, particularly on X. So if you remember the when I showed you the Jackson Hinkle um, tweet, it is connected to a video because videos on Twitter on X can be monetized now, uh, as long as you pay the platform some money to have the little blue check mark, uh, you can, if you have a lot of views, if you get a lot of um, engagement on your videos, you get money back. And in the sense, the platform becomes sort of a casino where it doesn't care what are you gambling on. Are you gambling on truth or are you gambling on lies? Are you gambling on pro-Palestine or, or pro-Israel? They, in the end, the house wins. They get, they collect views, they collect revenue uh, from advertising um, from all parties. Now, this is delicate dance and, and we, I do not want to go too much into this because obviously if you make too much conflicting bets, if you allow too much different types of parties on your platform, including very extreme parties, uh, then particularly if you're advertising platform, then as we see happening now, advertisers will turn away from you. But this is generally how we need to understand the uh, kind of platform ecosystem of conversations taking place online. And so for Stutzen to summarize this idea of conversation, democratic conversation is conversation not among intimates, nor among strangers, but among citizens or acquainted by virtue of their citizenships. Strangers will miscommunicate because they do not share background knowledge and commitment to common norms. Intimates will communicate without speaking, without stating their premises, without raising potential conflicts and embarrassments. Democratic conversation in contrast to both is a facility of public communication, sorry, under norms of public reasonableness, not simply a facility of social interaction. So for him, Communication is about uh, setting rules. Purchase. Communication is not necessarily about equality even. And this is quite a controversial statement in his paper, which I highly recommend if you like reading academic papers. 
where he talks about how uh, egalitarian approach to communication, this idea that everybody gets a voice, um, is not necessarily at the heart of democratic communication. But in fact, it is the procedure of how to make sure that people are heard and that the people who want to contribute to healthy conversations are heard and not those who want to hijack the conversation by, for example, uh, ignoring the concept of truth altogether. And here we get to the third and final point that I want to make, which is about truth and the problem of what I call epistemic collapse, which I'll explain shortly. This is from uh, uh, Shayan uh, Sardarizai. Uh, he is part of the BBC Verify team, the fact checkers and debunkers of BBC who do excellent job um, in general, but also very much recently with everything that has to do with fake news, misinformation, disinformation on the war. And he says, two denialist narratives about the Israel-Hamas war have sadly become prominent online. One, it was Israel that killed its own civilians on 7th October, not Hamas. And two, Hollywood Palestinian civilian casualties are fake crisis actors. Both are false, but get huge Twitter engagement. And I think like this is, this puts us into perspective. Like this are, he says, both are false, but get huge Twitter engagement. And again, if you go back to the, uh, you know, 2000 likes uh, that Hinkle got for claiming that, uh, you know, Israel is behind the, 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 the terrorist attack in Iran, you can understand the problem that this creates, right? Th those are like false claims that nonetheless uh, make rounds, create engagement, and potentially again, make money for people on Twitter, but also on other um, social networks like, yeah, you know, Telegram comes to mind, obviously, as the, the least regulated one. And, and this brings us to the uncomfortable question of like, if we want democratic conversations to produce true outcomes, to produce truth and to produce reasoning that helps us talk to each other and reach decisions and un understand the world in a way that is uh, maybe uncomfortable, but nonetheless beneficial to us as, you know, as, as a national society or maybe as a global society. Well, what is truth? How do we start understanding truth? And this is, of course, a very, very, very big question in philosophy, which, uh, and I'm not a philosopher, but I do find myself thinking more and more about this idea of epistemology, right? Which is um, a fancy word meaning, how do we know what we know? How do we arrive at knowledge? What kind of knowledge are acceptable or not? And I will not go too deep into the, the kind of the philosophical underpinnings of truth because we will be here all evening. And again, that's not my expertise. Uh, but you, if you open this uh, completely freely accessible entry from the Stanford Encyclopedia on Philosophy of Truth, you'll discover that unsurprisingly, uh, many have thought about this topic over the years. There are a lot, and I mean a lot, to say about what truth is and how to arrive at it. And we'd be spending the whole evenings if we were to try. But I do want to focus on this idea that truth is complicated because this is has been a notion that, that there has been much derided and attacked recently um, by people from, I think, many, many sides of many, many different debates. It's kind of like a, a problem of, uh, of postmodernism or, or a kind of, kind of academic erasure of truth of thinking of truth, like, you know, obviously we know what truth is. Truth is truth, right? So why complicate things? Why make this, this, you know, six and um, all sorts of uh, um, the subsections of, of what truth is? But I think it is important to understand briefly where this is coming from, like where this um, uneasiness of, of defining truth comes from. So, um, this is a short interactive portion of the uh, of the evening. You can uh, reply to me in comments, in chat. Anybody knows what th this is? You can also reply to me by unmuting yourself, to be honest. That might be easier. 
or raising your hand. Anybody? Yes, this is the Himalayas. Thank you, Eva. Specifically Mount Everest, uh, the highest mountain in the world. Good. Next. Uh, this one. Nope. This one. Nope. Right, sorry about that. I have uh, um, can you, you hear me okay? Yes, okay, good. This one, previous one was Everest. This one. Come on, it's not fair that I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> all right, I'll spare. If no guesses, then this is the um, this is Mount Hilmon. You might have heard of it. Yes, uh, it is uh, the tallest place in Israel, two hundred two thousand two hundred thirty six meters. Uh, on the Syrian side, it goes up to two hundred. 8,000, which is almost uh, kind of slightly more than one third of the Everest, actually. Um, last but not least, for the uh, home audience, anybody knows where this is? It's a fun game of mountain spotting. It is indeed in Holland, says Simone. Uh, specifically, this is the Falsterberg in Limburg, the tallest ah. mountain, so to speak, in the Netherlands, with a whooping 322 meters. Uh, so considerably less than both Helmon and the um, Himalaya, but nonetheless, having the word in its name, uh, being at least in the Netherlands considered a mountain. So this is a question to, to the, you know, to us all, what makes a mountain a mountain? Like why those three very real, very physical, uh, actual geographic things, uh, nonetheless, are very different in terms of both their features, you know, snow, no snow, slope, no slope, and objective measurements nonetheless considered mountains. Uh, one might say, and in a very much derided sentence these days, it depends on context, right? Or paraphrasing US Supreme Court Justice uh, Potter Stewart in his 1964 verdict on freedom of expression uh, versus pornography, um, I won't attempt to define it, but I know it when I see it, right? So we want to attempt to define mountains, but we know it when we see them. In fact, um, there is no universally accepted definition of a mountain, right? Um, this is from Wikipedia, which is pretty good source for those kind of things. Elevation, volume, relief, steepness, as spacing and continuity have been used as criteria for defining a mountain. And so if, you know, the, the, this is a bit funny, right? This is a bit ridiculous. But if we cannot seem to agree on what a mountain is, this presents us with a problem of truth. So this is from uh, a um, from Instagram, people uh, using the hashtag Falserberg to tag their posts from that area. And then the question, if I ask the question, are these people taking selfies on a mountain? or taking pictures from a mountain, then we first need to decide, well, to truthfully answer this question, we need to first define what a mountain is. And since we don't have a definition, a agreed definition of what a mountain is, we can never arrive at a true statement uh, regarding people taking pictures at this. And I understand that it sounds like pretentious philosophical problem for people like me, 
sitting in the universities. Um, and of course, we can recognize that this is not, uh, you know, that a mountain is a mountain. But just to make it clear how sometimes difficult it is to start treating truth seriously without needing to result to some sort of like, you know, internal feeling, internal conviction that we know what truth is and not using some sort of like defined uh, definitions of truth. Um, this problem, particularly problem of academics using, you know, modern or, or more specifically postmodern theory to kind of nibble a truth uh, has been widely discussed inside academia itself. And, and I want to point you at a text that I like very much that is uh, now 20 years old. So long before the, the rise of social media and the current war by French sociologist, philosopher, thinker, public intellectual Bruno Tour called Why Has Critique Run Out of Steam? And there is a sentence there that really resonates today, particularly with this rampant denialism of the horrors of the 7th of October. He says, remember the good old days when revisionism arrived very late after the fact, as after the facts have been thoroughly established de decades after bodies of evidence have accumulated. Now we have the benefit of what can be called instant revisionism. The smoke of the event has not yet finished settling before dozens of conspiracy theories begin revising the official account, adding even more ruins to the ruins, adding even more smoke to the smoke. And he talks, this is a, a really interesting and long, well, not very long, but longish text where he essentially calls for uh, social sciences and the humanities to uh, revise their method of critique, the kind of common approach in social science and humanities to uh, opening up everything from text to social relations to institutions and make them more constructive. So make critique constructive by adding reality to the things that we analyze in, academ in academia rather than subtracting or removing realness from them. And I'll get to how he does that in briefly in the conclusions to this talk. But to do justice to the other, uh, you know, one of the words in the subtitle of my talk that I promised you, I want to think about this idea of adding reality or subtracting reality um, through the lens of generative AI. So generative AI is the hot new thing. Uh, it is using AI, artificial intelligence, which is um, a subset of machine learning uh, or an expansion of machine learning, depends on who you ask, uh, which is using statistical methods with data to train machines to do the work previously associated with human or that to produce results that are generally uh, can be mistaken or, or can be attributed to human-like intelligences, right? So basic, basically AI is everywhere. So when, when you think about, you know, um, uh, when you think about Mobili, you're, a lot of you are driving with little Mobili devices on top of your cars. It uses uh, mach machine vision, uh, and this is a, an AI component, or this is a subset of AI that uh, attempts to kind of gather information from the environment and makes it like readable to the computer in order to warn you in time. So there are many, many different types of AI, which we cannot cover here, but generative AI. So this is the type of things that um, you encountered recently, like chat GPT for texts or uh, DALI or stable diffusion for images. And there are more and more, uh, there are sound generative AIs, there are video generative AI. So things where you can like, type in a, a description of a sentence uh, and, and it will make a photo for you or it will make a short video for you. Or you can ask it, write me a letter of recommendation in an official language uh, pertaining this and this and that, and it will generate the letter for you. And this, this ability to, to tell it to do it in a particular style or in a particular tone 
is also very uh, impressive for uh, for people who who encounter it for the first time. But the way that it does so is essentially by ingesting massive amount of pre-existing text. So it's very good at making um, of, of basing things that are in the mainstream, in the uh, in the common kind of knowledge repository of humanity, right? So one, so when it looks at, at like war photos, and there are a lot of war photos that have been made throughout history and scanned, um, you know, and digitized and, and are available online, it learns slowly through looking at, you know, millions and millions of war photos, what a war photo is. And then it can break it down and, and generate something like this, you know, which is a, um, an image that has been shared uh, many times um, and also as a, both as in itself, but also as an example for a fake image, um, usually like with many early examples of uh, AI generated images, you need to really count the number of fingers. This is the things that, that, that the positions of fingers, uh, but this is exactly the, the type of uh, things that AI and generative AI specifically is very good at creating type of images that are very easily and very cheaply creating type of images that are easily mistaken for uh, realistic images. But also it can, when you think about text, it can read and understand text to some degree. And again, understand is, is very, is a minefield when we talk about those things, but it can create the, the appearance of understanding and the response in the style that you've assigned it to. So why am I telling you all this? Because this leads us to what already in 2018, a uh, scholar and kind of tech activist, Aviv Ovadia from Stanford uh, called the infocalypse. The future, he says, will arrive with a slew of slick, easy to use and eventually seamless technological tools for manipulating perception and falsifying reality for which terms have already been coined reality apathy, automated laser fishing, and human puppets. So he talks about this idea, or already a couple of years ago, uh, six years ago, he was talking about this idea, and many others have followed, and actually many others have talked before him, but I like this idea of the infocalypse, um, where the cost of participating in online conversation becomes so steep because of the way that uh, everything is suspect, right? Because if everything is is potentially manipulative, if everything is potentially a lie, if every talk with a person you don't know online is is maybe an, a bot, an AI trying to to mislead you, then you might just withdraw completely or almost withdraw completely from public conversation and public life. This will make the cost of engaging in public discussion unbearable because you will have to verify everything because you will have to uh, you know argue with bad faith actors about what is computer generated and what is not because the information sphere will be flooded with so much garbage and even if we do have tools to discern this garbage that you will be become apathetic real apathetic, apathetic to reality as he says and this is a situation that that I dread very much, to be honest. And I'm thinking often uh, with other people in my field of how to avoid those things. A uh, situation that I call epistemic collapse. Remember that I talked to you about epistemology? Well, where the reality that is reflected to us from online no longer depends on who you um sorry, it actually does depend on who you are. It depends very much on who you are and who your friends are and what kind of in-group um, discussions you get into. And the conversations that we have online become more like the sociable type of conversations that we have with friends, even if they are about serious political issues, because we are all becoming part of the same in-group and we're all getting fun engagement from this conversation. And they become less and less like the uh, goal-oriented conversations of Hutchins, uh, where the aim is to maybe have complicated and uncomfortable and confrontational conversation. The nonetheless aim 
at some form of truth. Now, I don't want to leave you completely in the gloom and doom. So in the last two minutes, I will briefly talk about potential solutions to the things that we have talked about. So Latour has, Bruno Latour had, has had a solution for quite a while. He talks about moving from matters of fact, the statements of kind of like, oh, of course it's real because we can see it, to matters of concern. He says uh, the points of reviving the old etymology of, and he talks about um, uh, things um, and, and the way that the old etymology of, of thingness, of how things have reality uh, that is connected to the way parliaments, particularly in Nordic and Germanic countries, are named after the word for thing, because this is the place where you bring the things into this discussion where you discuss the things, right? So he says, reviving this old etymology isn't that we don't assemble because we agree, look alike, feel good, or socially are socially compatible or wish to fuse together, but because we are brought by divisive matters of concern into some neutral, isolated place in order to come to some sort of provisional makeshift disagreement. So he says, truth exists. Truth is real. Truth needs to be proven, but maybe in order to strengthen the reality of truth, we also need to talk among ourselves of how we arrive at truth, which kind of institutions, which kind of places are conductive to the discovery of truth, which kind of expertise we want. Uh, following that, don't do your own research. <laughs> and by that, I mean, don't, don't do your own research, but be aware, do your own research has become a rallying cry of, uh, conspiracies everywhere, and that society is complex and things are complicated. And experts exist because sometimes it takes a long time to understand the thing. Things are not easily understood through a half an hour of Google search or watching a YouTube video. So this is also like, this is very elitist of me, right? I am a university professor. So of course I say, don't do your own research, trust me. Uh, but yes, I do have some, you know, sense of entitlement to saying that. I do think that knowledge institutions like universities or professional institutions like a certain, you know, um, public um, entities or doctors exist because some knowledge is complicated, some things are complex, and we need mediation of experts to understand them. This is why. I'm very much in favor of um, public broadcasting, like the BBC or Khan in Israel, where it is disconnected from both commercial interests and political interests, if it's done properly, where um, journalists as kind of a professional fact checkers and finders of things can do their job relatively uh, in neutral grounds, right? So this is an example of an institution that I think is worth preserving. And this is the type of institution that can help with uh, the discovery of truth. And finally, um, we can think about using artificial intelligence to fight disinformation and misinformation and strengthen the truth. As I said before, uh, AI is a tool, generative AI is a tool. Uh, Latour would probably describe it also as a thing or as an assembly of things that can help us understand other things. It includes multiple actors. If we understand how it's made, who are the people promoting it, if both uh, industry and government and academia work together and check and control each other a bit, we can maybe, um, you know, use it for good. One thing it does well is training on existing data sets. This includes, can include data sets of fake images or fake takes text generated by other AI models. Uh, we can think uh, already there are companies who use generative AI for automatic moderation of discussion to reduce toxicity or raise civility online. Uh, we can use AI to, to create so-called um, poison pills of uh, online image repositories, which would make it difficult for new AI, unverified AI models to train them. Essentially, I'm not going too technical, and, and, and I feel like I'm going too technical here. We can use generative artificial intelligence to as a tool. And tools are very much defined by 
how people use them. So we shouldn't demonize them. We shouldn't also elate them as kind of a solution for all society problem, a tendency that very much comes from Silicon Valley that is often referred to as techno solutionism, right? You can solve all ill, all bad things, whether like social or economical, just by introducing a technology. But just being more aware of the type of technologies that are emerging in the world, of the type of conversations that they allow or disallow, and the type of truth uh, searching that it ha can help or hinder us to do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, I think there were some people who sent messages with questions. Can you see the messages? Yes, I can. I can see some. So I I can refer to some of them. Uh, one journalist have political agendas distorting public opinions. Um, sure, but why does it? Uh, but what is the alternative? Who, journalists also have um professional training they are um part of organizations that uh, are also the and, and again this is this is a very big generalization right because there's different type of journalism journalists and different types of entities but you can also look at this as kind of like uh journalists undergo a process of socialization among peers among institutions that at the very least are justified, not, not justified, are uh, encouraged to pursue truth in the very least basic level of fact-finding and cross-examination. Now, you can say jur journalists are uh, have political biases, again, depending on which country, which jurisdiction, which places, but then the, my question is again: What's the alternative? Like, what is the alternative? If we just if we decry all journalists as biased and all information as fake, particularly coming from official sources, then who are we relying then on? That's that's my problem always with this claim that you know journal that journalists have bias. Everybody have bias. The journalists are part of a professional class that try to at the very least mediate complicated reality to the um, to the population. And you can also mitigate some of these biases by you know watching and reading different journalists. This is something that, that's possible to do. This is why pluralism in and media landscape is great. What, the alternative is Jackson Hinkle. The alternative is self kind of uh, self styled journalist or, or influencers who do not care for truth at all who are coming from completely one-sided dimensions. And if, you, if you're interested in thinking about journalism as a institution and as a business model, which is which I very much am, uh, you can look at kind of the role of um, different types of journalistic funding. So again, I mentioned, so you, you can think about in Israel, you have um, public broadcasting like Khan, you have commercial broadcasting, you have commercial news sites, you have more and more um, ex like donation-based journalism, which is quite interesting, right? So you have uh, organizations like Hashum uh, Lim uh, or Aina Shvit, which are mostly donation-based, which also leaves them vulnerable to other pressures, right? Because they then they're pressured by their donors. So maybe it's a bit more like um, the traditional kind of party line newspapers of old. But if you look at this, you could see that there are multiple types of journalistic organizations and, and you can look at different types of sources and different types of, and also like it, it depends on whether you look at uh, facts or um, um, or editorials, et cetera, et cetera. So, th so this is my answer. I mean, this is like kind of a bit, the answer is, is, is democracy great? No, but it's better than the alternative. Is current uh, media institutions great? Probably not, but to me, it's better than the alternative, right? Um, what else? Mini, what about mini, the diverse... 
I mean, I think many people can pose as journalists. Yes, this is like this is again. That's this is that's why, one of the problems. This is why I I still believe very much in traditional journalistic institutions. This is why I yeah. think like after edu you know, after being educated, but many are not. This is why, like you know, places like newspapers and TV stations, and um, professional new websites, as opposed to influencers and social media, usually, as particularly as they come with like some sort of pedigree, you know, um, have your New York Times, you idiot uh, not have some ability to vet and justify and also be like bear the co the consequences of of lying or misleading people this is not always the case for um you know new types of um again not not new types but but like those type of like independent very uh, influence based semi quasi journalism that we see more and more online that rake engagement by just pandering to the audience. Like we can also, you know, like we talk about this as, um, like as a, as a political issue, but I think it's mostly an economical issue. Like you can create the type of news organization. It's 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 pretty profitable today to create the type of news organizations that cater directly to the views of a small subsections of audience. Especially if you do it on on like place like Twitter or YouTube, you can have a small team of people creating the news that are that you like to hear, and that you that you will donate money to it, and they will get advertisement for this. And this is and, and this will be very pleasant for everybody. Why listen to news that you disagree with? But again, the question is whether this is healthy for you know democracy for global conversations and stuff like that. Yochai, did you want to add something to your question? Yes, but you have to... Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very frightening lecture. But uh, um, in a very simplistic example, I want to ask you a very difficult question. If somebody claims that one plus one is three, what do I do? I find a mathematician to prove him wrong or I start a different campaign claiming that one plus one is four proving him wrong by seeing the abnormality of my claim as well. Yeah. Uh, I think you just, uh, I mean, you just tell him it's two and we go on from there, right? So this is this is part of my, this is part of my point. Like we don't have to, uh, we don't have to e engage with people who are obviously, uh, who are not good faith actors. And this is also part of like, our challenge, not as individuals. I didn't think like, think about like, uh, th there is this really famous um, web comics that, that is, is often get cited on internet, like discussions. Somebody, I can't go to sleep. Somebody is wrong on the internet, right? Uh, like, go, you know, th th think about all the people who are wrong on the internet. So the one plus one discussion is you, you don't need to find a mathematician because like, some things are has been established as facts and some things have been established as facts very deeply and we know them to be facts because well previous expertise often we know it you don't need to find a mathematician because you've you know we all have a basic understanding of calculus that we all got from school so we can and and we have fingers fingers helps right one one two um and and this is but 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 this is the problem with facts right some facts are very basic prove me that like things fall downstairs well you know try to find something on my desk that i can drop without too much damage but i can't imagine that i drop a pencil right there, those so facts are tricky sometimes because some facts are are very solid and robust and some facts are not and latour actually talks a lot about that so he is very much concerned about climate change in this paper he tells about like he he's a, he's a, he's studied he himself studied for many years um, um, scientists and and researchers and did like sort of uh, sociological work in labs showing that not always science is as straightforward as we think and he often was accused of like you know disassembling science essentially of making science less concrete and he says no well what I always try to do is actually show 
is, is strength and size. It show like that despite attempts by people to credit or discredit, some things are just becoming facts, no matter how other people try to discourage them. And he is, was very concerned by the fact that, that, that other people, particularly in American politics, would use his work or people like him work to say, well, you see, like climate change is not fine. Climate change, you see some people are still debating it. It says, no, well, that's not what my, my work and, and like my field's work is about. My field work is saying, yes, of course there is discussion. Of course, science is a social affair, is, is something that humans can disagree on. But we show that despite the disagreements, truth emerges. And this is what we need to do with uh, more complicated and more tricky facts as well, that we need to find our allies, gather uh, facts and specialists, and in the end, show that, uh, you know, that those facts are facts. And it might be difficult, but like, I don't see any other way. Hope it's, it's an answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess there are more uh, questions, questions in the chat. In the chat, yeah. David Leo had a question in the chat. When you encounter okay. obviously fake news or messages on social media, do you try to engage? Thank you for uh, Come with an argument or just ignore? It really depends on, I don't think there is one fit all uh, answer. I also, I know that there are um, attempts to kind of automate discussions, automate conversations. So I saw like, uh, uh, again, using ChatGPT generative AI platform where you kind of like, you put an argument in and it gives you a counter argument out. Um, I think that social media, and, and again, social media is a big thing. I, for example, I think that Twitter is a lost cause. I think that the, the changes that has been to the platform recently um, and kind of the the lack of moderation and lack of trust and safety teams uh, has made it uh, much more toxic than it even used to be before. And every attempt to engage with people you don't know on this platform is probably just fueling entertainment, like outrage entertainment uh, that, that gives Twitter its angry views, its hate watch, and not necessarily uh, helps, but if you if you have people in common, if you know people, uh, you can try to engage with them, right? So so it also depends on whether you see it like as a as a completely random discussion, right? You know, uh, talk between, don't read the comments, uh, or if it's actually people you know. And I found like the best thing is approach people in private rather than continue the conversation in. Uh, um, on public forum, because it also, um, Scottson gives this really interesting example in his uh, article about democracy, about how when the American founding fathers came together to, to set up the United States, uh, one of the proposals was to register the votes, right? Uh, that every, to have subsequent rounds of votes and every time the proposal would be, all the votes would be registered uh, day in, day out. And one of the people, um, was vehemently opposed to this and he won in the end because he said like the moment that your vote has been registered the moment that it's on paper then you are much less likely to change your mind even if your mind has been changed because there is a record that you voted this way and if we want to achieve you know changing opinions then maybe we don't want to change to to you know register each person's vote every time but, re, but just like the final result in order to allow people this room to change and change their mind. And Twitter is essentially like this forever or social media is this forever. Your opinion has been stated. Moreover, you will get attacked for your opinion often, which will then make you more hardly support this opinion. So the idea that opinions, that hearts and minds can be won on social media in general, and, and I'd say Twitter in particular are to me uh, yeah not so I, I don't think I don't think this is very easy and I don't think it's the platform for them um I think change is a very important word because yeah. I, I see when I look at the chat there's one question about uh, universities and anti-semitism in the USA and um 
I think that things are changing because there's public opinion, there were reactions, and uh, now slowly things are changing. People withdraw their money. But then it's a, it's BBC, also like, the it's BBC. It's also a question of uh, visibility and and action. This is always this is always a problem for us in social sciences. Are things are visible? Like are things reflect the situation? For example, in the media, because now something has changed in society or is something changed in the media that shows things that were already existing in society but weren't allowed on the media so far you know yeah so yeah but here's also... the other one bbc so the media bbc defined hamas as a militant group so definitions may vary yeah but um, then, and, and then so, they apologize so, the, for some so of this. bbc has changed yeah, but this is but this is also this is the thing that there there was a, a, a public a, a public outcry and they had to defend apologize or defend for for their decisions. Yeah, and of yeah. course you ha you should know that like you, just the same way that that Israelis are deriding BBC or the New York Times, um, this happens on the Palestinian side as well. Like for every condemnation that you have of like BBC calling uh, Hamas a military wing instead of like. A terrorist organization uh you have people from uh like palestinians saying oh you know the new york times calls uh the, the 7th of october um like people who died on the people israelis who died on the 7th of october were killed uh but palestinians uh, who died died you know like the, the, it's endless conversations mm -hmm. but i think it's healthy to some extent i think it's healthy that those conversations happen i think that this is kind of if those conversations would not happen, if you were to remain again in your kind of little information bubble, um, and if there was no shared big sources, which we can all hate together, the BBC and the New York Times, then we would not be also, we would also not know of the things that happened on the other side. Okay. I is there think, anyone? Uh, I think we're coming to a close, right? Yes, uh, I I see that the last remark is, thank you, Alex, for your wonderful lecture, <laughs> and thank you for thank you an for enlightening attention. lecture, and thanks to organizers and contributors. <laughs> so I think, I think that uh, says that we are at the end of this uh, beautiful lecture, and uh, thank nice you very much. session, Good nice leven gaan. Good avond. And um, we will be in touch. Thank you very much. And I wish everybody uh, a good evening. If you want to chat between each other for some time, like a bite cafe. Yes, you can continue, but we leave. <laughs> bye bye. Do you know further? Marion. Nay, I, I, I was on mute and I just wanted to mention and uh, thank you because nobody did that and nobody and didn't have the chance to do that for the wonderful organization and lots of time I know you spent to get this together. And really, we are very, very grateful to you for organizing mm -hmm. this and suffering a long time since the war and changing okay. everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. we hope for better times. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is there anyone who wants to continue speaking with each other? I'm going. Okay, I wish you all well. a good year. And yes. Thank you very much, yes. Alex, also. Yeah. And we see you you. each other again. Bye bye. Well, Toaster. That's a good year.